Welcome everyone. I would like to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. We stand on the lands of the Ghana people today. Um, my name is Ellen Fraser Barber. I am a member of the Health Performance Council. The Health Performance Council is a statutory body which provides expert advice to the Minister for Health and Wellbeing. We provide advice about the operation of South Australia's health system, health outcomes for South Australians, and the effectiveness of community and individual engagement methods. The Council's advice focuses on health outcomes not only for South Australian population as a whole, but also for particular population groups. All of the Council's reports are published on our website. The Minister for Health and Wellbeing commissioned us to undertake a review of matters pertaining to the health outcomes of people with disabilities. We wanted to know about their experiences of the health system. This is a significant project which involves a number of gathering analysing insights from sources of data, but most importantly from people's lived experiences. There are two members of the Council leading this work, myself and also Professor Janine Greenhill. Most importantly, we decided from the start to get external input. It's not fully co-designed, but we are taking some of the principles of stakeholder involvement. And we have convened the project advisory group to assist us. We sought broad membership from health, disability, government providers, also from commissioners, advocates, and from people who work in Adelaide and country as they health, and most importantly, from people with lived experience. We had a pretty broad remit to begin with. We reviewed matters pertaining to issues around equity in health outcomes for people with disability, and also about their experiences with the health system. We also wanted to know about issues around the interface between disability and health sectors. We, the Council, advise the Minister for Health that we can't directly advise on disability or national agendas, but we can certainly influence and advise the Minister for Health on where he should direct his attention. We started our advisory group in workshop. We wanted to define exactly what we should be doing and we worked out what the key issues were and also some of the questions that we should be seeking to answer through our review. By doing that, we could then work out how we go about answering these questions. We determined that we would need two broad categories of inquiries. First, we could answer some by analysing what is out there. This included getting hold of data from hospital activity data, disability services data, and data on death and dying, as we know that people with disabilities die younger. We needed that at record level and safely linked so that we could get into the data and get real insight. That took us a year and frankly it got us nowhere. Really systemic issues that make it exceptionally hard to get hold of data for analysis. Jumping ahead of myself, but that is something that emerges from this review as a real finding. There is some aggregate data that we can analyse, but it doesn't really get us down into the deep, insightful analysis that we wanted. The second line of fresh inquiry was about stories from people, especially lived experiences, but also from people who have valuable information to share, including people who worked in the health system workforce. That's mostly what I'm going to share with you today. We found out in our preliminary work lots of reports of good system experiences, but there were also some areas for improvement. There were issues around workforce training opportunities, also about how complaints are handled in systems, and also about issues of continuity between health and disability services. So we determined that we needed to understand better what the issues are for people with disabilities. We needed to know more about their experiences and also about how those experiences impact on health and wellbeing, but most importantly about how we make change. We started a consultation to do just that. We worked with the Public Sector Innovation Lab to create a process to learn directly from people with lived experience. People with disabilities, family, advocates, health system staff, actually anyone who had something to share. 
The process involves interacting directly with people and we have four methods in play. First, we had an online submission form with only one question. It was a chance for people to write about what they wanted to share with us. This was hosted for us and also put on the Your Say Essay website. We had a special email address set up and an online form, but we realised this isn't always accessible to everyone. However, there were still many people who made good use of this, sending in long submissions directly. We went on the road with a series of drop-in sessions where people could come in and speak with one of us. They could share their thoughts in a safe environment and speak with us face-to-face -face in a more interactive way. Everyone is different and some people prefer, prefer that kind of engagement, whereas others prefer less interactive ways. We did that in Adelaide, Bury and in Mount Gambia. We would have loved to have gone to more places, but we were held back by logistics and budget, so we were only able to do two country visits. We had some longer in-depth one-to-one interviews. We didn't expect much of a take-up, but we thought it was important to offer this as a way of engaging. Here we were on the road. This is Bury. This is Mount Gambia. On the right, that is Janine, my colleague from the Health Performance Council. This is in Adelaide at the Innovation Lab offices. These photos were, of course, done with people's permission. We promoted these consultations widely, but apologies if you didn't know about it. We would love to know how we could do better next time. The Your Say team helped us a lot with promotion, especially through their social media network. They estimated that we reached 45,000 people. Our minister also tweeted, and the Minister for Human Services as well. I tweeted, and it was also on Facebook. We also did our own direct email campaign, which was quite targeted. We compiled a list of agencies and service providers and others and we let them know and ask them to pass the message on. This also included our advisory group members too. And for our country visit, we did old-fashioned newspaper ads. We were advised that this is highly effective in the country. Janine also ran on local radio and promoted our consultation. The result was, I think, quite good. 144 people responded to us. Not many out of 1.7 million residents, perhaps, but actually quite good for this sort of thing. They gave us quite a lot of rich material to work from. Now, we didn't restrict who could engage with us. That was deliberate. This wasn't supposed to be a closed consultation. But we were still disappointed that most people who engaged with us were speaking on behalf of people who live, living with a disability. That was a concern, as we do worry about the barriers to people being heard. This is a concern around institutional ableism. It can mean that even unintentionally, our work was designed in a way which created barriers and meant that some people were excluded. And we are aware of some of the limitations, such as the fact that we didn't have specific Aboriginal voice partly because we ended up with no Aboriginal membership in our advisory group. So we lacked some legitimacy there. But we are trying to amend this and we are working to get a separate consultation underway to try and fill this gap. We didn't loop back and validate what we had heard. Have we got it right? Did it resonate? We had something planned, a big forum where we would do that. Minister Wade had even agreed to come. It was all organised and then COVID-19 happened, so we couldn't hold a big event like that. Now, I think you'll be interested in knowing some of what we had learned from the consultation. We learned a lot and we categorised these into seven themes. These themes were access to services, health and care systems, health workforce, continuity and system interfaces, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Money Matters and more broader issues of government and society. And under these themes, I think there were a number of surprises to us. So telehealth was really good for some, but terrible for others. 
It was interesting that our data collection overlapped with COVID-19 as it was kicking off, because people who spoke with us at that point were quite relieved. Many of them had been asking for telehealth for years, and finally it was possible. But there were lots of barriers to access, especially in regional areas, but in Adelaide as well. People said that they were let down by the system. Fancy having to bring your own specialist equipment to hospital for yourself or your child, because otherwise it means going without. But that is the reality for some. And with all respect to the memory of Anne-Marie Smith, which has really raised the profile of issues of equity, but unfortunately we heard that there is mistreatment and trauma. People can feel harassed and intimidated. Children who need support must have active parents and they need to be really strong advocates for their children. A delay at a young age can mean a significant impact from a developmental perspective. Some simple things too, like music programs, have been wonderful, especially in rehabilitation. People would like more of these kinds of things. When you have disabilities, you can be socially isolated, and these programs can assist and aid in recovery. There is very poor feedback and action on patient satisfaction surveys. And data is collected but hidden away and not used to do good. The health workforce, that's you, and I have to say a lot of people had nothing but praise for you. But in fairness, there were also some things that we were told which could be addressed. Staff were not always understanding of disability or how to work with people with disability. Health workers were unfamiliar with disability and may not know when someone has an invisible disability, such as autism or dementia. That is not anyone's fault. It is not deliberate. What we were told is that education is important and often lacking. So that is something that should be improved on. We are not saying that nurses and doctors and others intend to have a poor attitude, but it can come across that way. And we kept hearing again and again that training and education, that is what is definitely needed. Some people highlighted that there are good communication processes, but in general there is poor discharging. One thing highlighted in the state in Queensland in particular is that they have more long-term outlooks on discharge planning. The lack of coordination gets people frustrated and there is often tension and the person with disability is the one that has the burden of all of those tensions. It is particularly difficult for people with comorbidity who do not just have one single issue but many. Next we have the NDIS. There were mixed feelings about this. It was a long section of our report on what we heard. Some people have fantastic plans and were really successfully learning how to navigate the NDIS to their advantage, but others have not. So there is kind of a hit and miss. There is failure and success with the NDIS. And that is actually a safety and quality issue. There are some people who are vulnerable and they can be missed out. I don't want to get too much into the Anne Marie Smith case, but that is an example. And this is the sort of thing that the Safeguard and Task Force have just reported on. Money matters, especially when living with a disability means that you have to spend out of pocket and you can least afford it. The setup can lead to quite perverse incentives too. Get a job and you will lose your medication help. It's very unfair. That's how many people found it. It was difficult and quite disjointed. Things can be expensive. There are lots of medications that people rely on and it is also very frustrating when people cannot always be bulk billed by their GPs. Why not? Last but not least, the broader issues in government and actually in society more generally is that there needs to be more public information and understanding. There also needs to be better facilities, better public transport, more accessible systems and just a generally more positive experience for people with disabilities. There are simple issues like parking problems all over the place, even in new facilities. And there are other accessibility issues. Would you believe it, in this day and age, even in new buildings, there are not accessible toilets. All of these things add to the experience of mistreatment and trauma that people already experience. So that is in summary what we heard. 
That's not all that we have to inform our report, but it is a big part of it and an important part. I can't say what our findings and advice will be yet because we haven't yet written it. And most importantly, we haven't yet put it through to our advisory group and validated. But these are some of the important findings that are emerging. So things around access to services and how a lot of that doesn't even mean spending a lot of money, but just being less rigid in service design and education is important to make things better. That's why I'm so pleased to know that many of you have joined this forum today. But there is a lot, and I mean all of us, have a lot to do in terms of learning. And not just us, but actually everyone in society. There's a lot that we've heard, which is about institutional and systemic ableism. It can be hidden, covert and unintentional, but these services and structures and systems in society can be designed in a way that discriminates. There are some concerns that came up around vulnerability. I spoke with the Safeguarding Task Force and they were interested in what we have been learning. There are some overlaps and there's also the open question of how healthcare settings are ensuring safeguarding of South Australians with disabilities. We need to find ways to mitigate and remove the risk and vulnerability that people with disability experience. That kind of ties in with continuity issues, silos of data and silos of working. Not always, but systematically there can be a lack of coordination. We have the opportunity with this review to advise on how we fix that. It can come true in people having an intensity of care that isn't justified. I don't like the term bed blocking, but you probably know what I mean when I say this. Data is key. I mentioned before that we couldn't get linked data that we needed to answer some of our questions. We are not alone in that. It is a structural issue, it seems, with data governance, information governance, and a cultural thing around data ownership and governance. It can be improved. Did you know that SA Health Hospital data collection doesn't even identify whether someone has a disability? So how are we supposed to analyse and make data-driven decisions? The data is not there, so the decisions that are being made are without data, and that is no good. And I think we will have things to say to help move our society to one that is less covertly ableist. It is a tough concept, I get that, but we will have to try. So we've had a lot to say and we still have some work to do to finish off our review, which will go to the Minister. But it will be published on our website too. We always make sure that we publish our work. As a council, we are around for maybe six months until February, perhaps a little less. So that is when we definitely must finish our report. But it is important to say that the final report is not the end. Advice to the Ministry is all well and good, but only if it is implemented. Sometimes we can step in and help implement our own advice with further audit work, reviews and reports. We can't do everything. We are really an audit body, but our advice is public in the community. So it is out there. And we also have a history of revisiting our past work. We don't like just publishing a report and saying, job done. Thanks very much for listening today. I want to acknowledge the very important work of our advisory group. We just wouldn't have the legitimacy without them. And of course, I would like to thank everyone who shared their stories with us in the consultation. We couldn't have done it without you. Some intellectual property to acknowledge as well. Thank you very much for listening.